I really want to step into something that's not safe? Do I really want to do something that's uncertain? Do I really want to step into something that's inconvenient? And do I really want to step into something that's beyond what I can do on my own? Several weeks ago, I started studying a passage of scripture, in Joshua chapter 1, about this new story that's about to begin for Joshua. And as I'm reading that passage, I started to notice some really huge shifts in the life of Joshua. And um, one of the first words that's being described is, uh, Moses, my, my servant is dead. And Joshua's going to get reminded about something really significant that a history that he had with Moses, 40 years of watching him do incredible things, is over. And God basically is announcing to Joshua, hey, I'm about to do something brand new, and I'm going to do that with you. And he says that as I was with Moses, I will be with you. So I want you to pack your bags, and I want you to get ready. And when I think about that, I think that about that movement that's going on in your life, thinking about the transition that, that you as students are about to make in the next several weeks and wondering like, okay, are they really going to pack their bags? Are they really going to leave? Now, living in where you're living, you may be forced to do that. But there's coming a day that you're going to have to decide whether you're going to pack your bag or not. And so Joshua's in this amazing situation that he's been watching and watching and watching Moses do some incredible things. And he's obviously being inspired by it. He's obviously being motivated. But suddenly, Moses is gone. Your professors are going to be gone someday. Your friends are going to be gone someday. And there's going to be a brand new set of friends and a brand new set of circumstances. And as I started to get deeper into that, the context of that scripture, Joshua has a choice to make. He has a decision to make. He doesn't have to follow through with what God's asking. He could totally ignore it. Like you, you're building a business strategy. You're actually thinking about something that you really want to do with your life. And when you think about that, you're having to navigate choices, decisions. And one of the, the decisions that you're going to have to make is, do I really want to pack my bags? Do I really want to step into something that's not safe? Do I really want to do something that's uncertain? Do I really want to step into something that's inconvenient? And do I really want to step into something that's beyond what I can do on my own? Because that's a part of the story about Joshua. Because when you start to really consider that passage of Scripture, he cannot do it by himself. He's on the other side of the Jordan, and God is telling him, I want you to cross the Jordan. And I'm wondering about, man, here's a guy that, that has never really done this on his own before. He's watched somebody else do it. You're interviewing different professionals. They're going to tell you stories about their lives and their experience, but yet it's still going to fall on you someday. It's still going to fall on you whether you're going to pack your bags or not. And when someone describes the next move in your life that it's not safe, that it's not certain, it's not convenient, and it's not something that you can do by yourself, we typically want to shy away from that. So what we typically do is that we step into something that's now manageable. Something that we can do without trusting anybody else. We'll, we'll make decisions about what's predictable. We'll step into something that is possible. We'll actually plan on something that's pleasing to everybody else. We want to make people around us happy, so we'll actually step into what pleases others. And that is not what God has called you to. So there's a this strange dichotomy that's going to go on. A plan A and there's a plan B. Plan A is not safe. Plan A is uncertain. Plan A is beyond what you can do on your own. That's plan A. That's not real great news maybe for some of you. But there's also plan B. And plan B, when we have that, we start to look at that as a very favorable situation that I can step into. Because it is manageable. It is predictable. It is possible. 
and that most people are going to accept plan B. They're going to go, yeah, that does make sense. Always have a backup plan. And we hear that all the time. There's some wisdom in that. But the attitude towards plan B is like, well, if plan A doesn't work out, at least I've got an option. And that option is dangerous. So we want to dig a little bit deeper about that. There's a passage in Matthew 25. And the reason why we're using scripture, scripture doesn't move. Our feelings move. Time moves. But scripture is consistent. So there's, there's this incredible story in Matthew 25 about the talents. And man, this is a, a pretty amazing story because there's this ruler that's going to give servants a large sum of money. And when he gives them that money, he's not even going to tell them really where to invest it. But he says, do something with it. You have four years of experience. And basically, God is asking you to do something with, you, with it. Like we've talked about building your life on a dare. Four years of experience. Either you're going to invest it or you're going to bury it. And that sounds so severe to us. That makes us really anxious when someone says, either you're going to invest into this career that God has designed for you before you were ever born, or you're going to bury it. So when you look at that story of the talents, two people, two individuals get a large sum of money. And they're given this money according to their abilities. And the third person is giving less money. So the one that's giving that money basically is helping that person say, hey, you know, you might be overwhelmed by this large sum, so I'm going to give you a sum of money that you can probably manage and probably make something of it. And I think that's a really graceful thing to, to do. Not that the person giving the money is not trusting, but there are times when, when God is asking us to step into something, he's going to ask us to step into it incrementally. You don't have to feel like plan A is this Mount Everest of an experience that if I don't do plan A, you know, the one dream thing that I've been wanting to do, if I don't step into it two weeks after I graduate, I'm failing. And then that is not true. He's asking you to step into something incrementally. So when we talk back and look back at Joshua, packing your bags is the first step. You know, getting the bag out, that may be plan A. Just doing something incrementally, making that step, making that move. Your business strategy is helping you to initiate that. So when we talk about details and making sure that you dream a little bit, we're actually asking you to invest into the future, even though the future has not arrived yet. So either invest or bury. Once you graduate, nobody really has to know what you buried. Nobody has to know that. So when you think about this idea that I'm asking you to do for your business strategy, I'm asking you to make a detailed strategy, something that, that really helps you to understand that there's a larger story than the one you're living now. I know for some of you, going to college was something that maybe overwhelmed you. Maybe you didn't know if you could do it. You didn't know if you could navigate all the pressure. You didn't know if you could navigate art alongside that. Is there any possibility of a future with my art? And so when someone looked at your portfolio your freshman year, they saw some potential in you. They saw something that was favorable. And basically, they were asking you to do something with it. And here you are four years later having done something with it. And your work should not look the same from your freshman year. Obviously, it's improved significantly. It's changed. And when you look back, you don't want to go back. You don't want to go back to your old artwork. You don't want to go back to the old way that you've done things. And so what you're looking at for plan A, plan A is an entrance. Plan A is an entrance into something brand new, something far better than you can imagine. That's plan A. Plan B is an exit. You're looking at, man, if this doesn't work out, this is the, this is the ramp I'm going to go off on. And if I ever meet up with plan A again, great. But it's going to be purely by accident. And I know this is really a very difficult thing to understand. 
Because when you're living in the situation that you're living in and plan A isn't in front of you, it's easy to avoid. But the business strategy is trying to get you to understand, you know what, I've got to write something down. I've got to do something about it and, and take an action step. So let me give you an example. Remember, I come from a family of no. Right? I was raised in a family of no. When I, there was a new adventure, you know, for whatever reason, my parents would say, ah, I don't know, that's not a good idea. It's kind of risky. No. And so I basically grew up with that mindset. So again, my first automatic response is what? No. No, I'm not going to do anything new. So several years ago, my wife invited me uh, to be a counselor at a, at a camp. Our boys were going to attend this camp, and she said, hey, it would be great. We'll all be together. Let's go for it. And so my first response was obviously, no, I don't want to go to the camp. It's going to be hot. It's in Tennessee. I, I don't want to be a part of that. And I don't say everything that I'm thinking to my wife about these things. I mean, I might, I might say it in a nicer way, but I'm just telling her, you know, it sounds great, but I, I'm not sure I really want to do it. And there's something hidden behind that no all the time, and it's usually fear. You know, I'm losing control. And so when you step into something, fear is right there to meet it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to greet you like a wall. And you're going to think, it's, I cannot get past this wall. And so I have learned to incrementally practice yes. So just let me, let me see. I'll, I'll check this out. Tell me a little bit more about this trip and, you know, give me a little bit more. And, and then finally, I'll tip into yes. But I'm, my first response, like I said, is even though I'm embarrassed about it, don't want to admit it, I come from a family of no, so that automatic response is right there and ready for me. So I decide to go because I think it's going to be a great experience. So she says it's down in Tennessee, and, and she tells me that this a guy named Gary is going to come. And I am so bummed to hear that because I know Gary and I know what he's about. And so we go down to Tennessee, and it's hot, and it is sticky. It's uncomfortable. It's not what I wanted it to be. I wanted air conditioning. I wanted, you know, all the comforts of home. I wanted to be able to, you know, navigate what I wanted to navigate. And finally, I just had to settle down and say, I just cannot have this attitude. So we're around a dinner table, and we're all talking, all the counselors and the kids, and everybody's having a good time. And then I look out the side window, and there is Gary pulling up with a bunch of students with their gear. And inside, I basically say, oh, no. And I know what's coming. For years, Gary has asked me to go repelling. He has asked me, you've got to do this with me. This is going to be a blast. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I'm, I would always say, yeah, of course we got to do that, Gary. We have got to do that because it is going to be fun. But I'm being brave from a chair. I'm telling him over coffee sometime, yeah, I'd love to do that. And finally, Gary shows up. And he said, Ron, I am so glad you are here. And I'm going, inside, I'm going, oh, I wish he wasn't. I wish he wasn't here. And so um, he tells me that we're going to take a group of students, and the college students that are with him are all experienced climbers. They have all their gear. They look like climbers. They dress like climbers. They got all the stuff. And I, for sure, don't look like one. Any of you climb, ever repel in this, in this room? OK. And you always remember the first time, I think, when you are doing this. And so um, we're over this coffee cup. And, and um, Gary's telling me, he says, Ron, you got to come with me tomorrow. We're going to go repelling. And I said, Gary, I'm sorry. I wish I could. I've got to work with the kids. You know how that is. And he goes, oh, you got to go. You got to go. And my wife immediately, I, I'll go. I'll go. And so she volunteers herself. She goes along with the group. And tucked inside my head is like, oh, man, why did she say yes? Because that means I'm going to get all the pressure, but I've got to create some good stories, good rationale why I don't want to do it, why I'm not going to do it. Because you know why I don't want to do it. I'm afraid. I don't want to admit that to anybody. I'm not going to voice that to anybody. So I'm going to take my little plan A, and I'm going to bury it. I'm going to make it into a plan B. So my wife goes out the next day, and she does it. She comes back out the whole day filthy. 
she comes back and she comes into the room where everybody's at, everybody's eating, and she announces, that was amazing. That was the coolest thing I have ever done. And I'm looking at her and she's just covered with dirt. And, um, and I'm just like in fear, but I'm not showing it. And she says, Ron, you have got to do it. You have got to go and uh, take Kyle, our son, with you. I hate it when she volunteers me like that. You know, it's like, see, you've got to do this. And so essentially, the next day comes, and I am just trying to put it together in my head how I can get out of this. And then Gary approaches me early in the morning. He says, Ron, he goes, man, I'm excited about you going. Gary, I really don't know if I can go. I've got to be with the kids, you know. And he's looking at me going, yada, yada, yada. I, you, like, I'm not even buying what you're saying. And he goes, Ron, why don't you just drive the van? And I know reverse psychology. I know what he's trying to get me to do. And he, sa- and he said, just come and drive the van if you want to do it. You know, come up with this, great. My son, Kyle, he's excited about going. So we're all in the van. We pull up. And this cliff looked like Everest to me. And I'm looking at this thing, and I go, I cannot believe that he's going to ask us to do it. We get out of the van. He goes, I said, Gary, why don't I just stay with the van and make sure it's safe? And he's like, Ron, no one's taking the van. We're in the middle of nowhere. It's just, just come with us. Just, you don't have to do anything. Just walk up. I'm walking up this cliff, this mountain path, and we're going above the clouds. No, we're not really, but it felt like that. And as I was walking up, I was getting more and more fearful. And I don't know about you, but one body part on me that, that shows my fear are my kneecaps. They shake. And my kneecaps are shaking, and I'm walking up there, and I know the group of people that we're with and all the other college climbers and their stuff is dangling and the ropes, are, you know, they're doing all that stuff. They're looking professional, and I know I'm not looking professional. So I'm embarrassed, I'm humiliated, but I, I'm walking up there and I said to myself, I said, God, first of all, you got to help me because I am really afraid. And as I got to the top of that mountain, if Gary asked for a volunteer, I've got to go. I've got to be the first one. So he asks. I say yes. Contradictory to my past, I say yes. And then all the students start helping me to get ready. And they start dressing you with the stuff. And as I can best remember it, I just remember bending down to one of those students who was very short. I said, are you sure this is like safe? And he goes, oh, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. It's going to be great. Are you sure it's going to be great? I just, oh, it's going to be great. You're going to love this. And it's like, no, I'm not. I am not going to love this. So I get all dressed, and Gary tells me, he says, Ron, now I want you to face me, and I want you to get your heels to fall off the back of that cliff. Just let them hang over the cliff. Don't move, but let your heels hang off. And as I did that, I just said to myself, I have got to be brave here, not just for myself but for Kyle. And he says, now I want you to, you know, get yourself positioned and I want you to pretend that you're going to sit back. And as I began to sit back, the ropes were holding me, obviously. And I said, Gary, are you sure you've got me? He says, oh, no, I totally got you. I got you. And he says, I want you to sit back like you're going to sit in a chair and just relax. And I'm listening to every word he says. I sit back And he says, now I want you to do something extra. I want you just to take one step, just one step. That's all you've got to do off that cliff. And that one step was so nerve wracking to me because I couldn't trust him, nor could I trust myself. And but when I did it, I eventually did it because I knew my son Kyle was watching. And I took that step. And I couldn't believe it held. And then he said, okay, take another one. And then another one. And then I was obviously past them visually, and I realized that I was actually repelling. And then I pushed myself off the mountain like I had this sudden surge of confidence. And as I was going down, and they were releasing the ropes, I'm going down this cliff, and I could not believe the adrenaline rush I had. And I got down at the bottom of the cliff, And I remember taking everything off as fast as I could. And I wanted to run up 
as fast as I could to Kyle and say, Kyle, it was amazing. It was so amazing. You got to do it, Kyle, because my example was going to give him courage. What I'm asking you to do about plan A is not just for yourself. Plan A is just not for you. Plan A is for others. You're doing this action as a service to others. You're not doing a plan A just for your own good, your greater good. It is for the greater good of others. So there's a master plan about doing plan A. Let me give you a couple things. First of all, plan A is a detailed strategy. When you are writing things down, when you're putting things down on your strategy, the details need to be in place. First of all, if you're going to move to California, you're going to move to a different state, you're going to basically write that date down that you're planning on leaving. And not only that, you're going to write the time you're leaving. You are going to plan this to every detail that you can possibly think about so that it becomes more real to you. Because that detailed strategy, when it's detailed, it starts, it starts to make sense to you. It becomes something more real to you. And I know that when you're sitting here in a situation where you don't actually have to act on it, it's a lot easier. But when you start to create the action, a totally different outcome starts to result. You can be nervous, you can be scared, you can be intimidated, but the, the issue is you've got to act. You cannot let that fear overwhelm you to the point that you can't even write something down that's bigger than you. The next thing that you want to be doing is that you want to announce your plan. This makes you vulnerable. When you announce it to others that, hey, you know what I'm doing? I'm moving to New York. I can't believe I'm actually doing this. You're announcing it to everybody, and everybody hears it. And when everybody hears it, that can make you nervous even more because now it's being announced. So when we go back to Joshua and we look back at that situation, he announced to the people, get ready, start packing your bags because in three days we're leaving. We're going to cross the Jordan. And when he announced it, he was banking on God coming through. He had no idea if God was going to do it the same way that Moses had done it. He has no clue. He had feelings just like us. In fact, he's encouraged the whole way. Be strong. Be courageous. Be bold. It's going to be fine. God is telling him that. And God is telling you that through me. I'm telling you, your plan A is awesome. Start announcing it. Next, commit to a board of accountability. People that will help you get things done. This interview process that you're doing. Keep everybody accountable. I, I just, I've done one interview. Gosh, I need to get more done. Hey, let me help you. Here's a couple names. You don't have to announce to the board who's on it. Like You don't have to name everybody who's on your board, but you need to have people that are going to keep you accountable to the dreams that you want to do. Not because you can't do them. It's just because you can't do them alone. Next, commit to the vision. There's something extraordinary that happens when you completely focus on something that is absolutely beyond you, but you're focused to do it. You are so focused and laser focused that you can actually accomplish something quicker because you're focused. But when you're focused with a vision, you're also focused about the outcome. This is what I want as a result. The next thing that helps with creating a detailed master plan is to empower others. So once you decide to make a move into doing this, everybody else becomes encouraged by you. They start to look at, boy, if, if Jesse can do it, I can do it. If Peter can do it, I can do it. If Addison can do it, I can do it. You know, if Courtney can do it, I can do it. They, people are watching you. People are looking at Matthew. They're looking at Katie. They're looking at Abigail. They're looking at Jesse and Chantel. They're looking at all of you to see if you're actually going to act on the plans that you know that God has for you. 
Because when we look at that, we look at something that is far greater than we could do on our own. So I just want you to think about this. I want you to think about the bag that you arrived with when you were freshmen. Three and a half years ago, you arrived with some bags. Those bags may still be with you. You may be using the same bags, but they're not going to the same place. You're not coming back the same way. You think differently, you act differently, you dream differently, but you're going to pack those bags again, and they're going to go into a, different, into a different place, a different spot. There's a different journey you're about to step into. And like Joshua, God is telling you, as I was with him, I am going to be with you. So be bold, be confident, be courageous, but start packing. Thank you.